colleagues, dear friends from ICOM, all from a number of countries around the world. Thank you for being with us again for this eighth, eighth session on our Zoom cycle on solidarities that we launched at the end of last year with our colleagues and friends from ICOM Finland, ICOM Greece, ICOM Israel, and also the International Commu Com Committee of Scientific and Technical Museums. I can see Esherki is here with us in the room. You know that this is a cycle of 10 sessions that we've designed in response to the uh, call for proposals from ICOM, uh, SAREC, that they initiated at the end of last summer for so that museums would have ways for meeting together to support one another. So our session is part of this perspective of what brings us together, what is helping us to be to show solidarity with one another through these incredible months of crisis, which uh, we're starting to come to the end of here in France. Uh, museums are starting to open up. Maybe some of you could tell us what it's like where you are. And today we've chosen a theme that's really appropriate, which also shows that at no time have museums lost sight of their meaning of what brings them together, what makes them authentic and so, so, helps them show solidarity with each other. Very quickly, museums started to collect objects, um, items, documents, texts that will in the future be a testimony of what this, this violent episode of COVID has been. So that's our subject today. What are the traces that we are collecting of COVID? Who's collecting them? Is it a question of solidarity? Is this something that we can do together? Is it something that promotes solidarity between museums? These are the questions we're going to try and cover today. I think this is actually one of our most important sessions because here we're really at the heart of our profession. And we've seen recently uh, that we've been thinking within ICOM about the museum definition and that's a, a question that's been created a lot of passion. When we asked you about what was important for you in terms of the museum definition, a, a, a large majority of people, especially in France but in other countries as well, was linked museums to collections. So what we're doing in museums, collecting traces of COVID. That's a fundamental museum act. And I think it is our honor to cover this subject today. I uh, thank you very, a big thank you to the group that's got together to prepare this session, our colleagues that I've uh, accepted to speak and Estelle Gildebut, who's going to moderate this session today, who's just here with me. Estelle is going to talk about how we um, record what is being said. So I won't say any more on that. One, one other thing to say is that this week is a special week for our members because this is the week for the uh, General Assembly, the Ordinary General Assembly and the Extraordinary General Assembly. Um, it's every year at uh, UNESCO and every three years for host countries. This is a key moment uh, for um, thinking about the governance of our organization. Um, this will be on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So some of us will be all together for the next three days. But I think it's really important to say how important we think it is to work together to have a voice within our organization. And I think this cycle that we've uh, been, uh, a number of people, uh, high numbers of people have taken part in from the beginning to the end. Sometimes we've had up to 200 people. I think it really shows 
to what extent our organization is a living one and how important it is for museums, how useful it is during this difficult period that we've been through. And as uh, our virtual General Assembly is going to take place from tomorrow, it's important that these signals are, are clearly expressed now. I'd really like to wish you an excellent afternoon. I shall be here next to us to, next to Estelle. Have a really good session. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very glad to be with you for this news. Next, uh, ICOM Solidarity session. I think this is going to be one of our most interesting sessions because we're going to think together about this notion of collection. How are we going to keep traces of this event once it's been, once we've we've passed after the shock and the 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 stun the stunned feeling around this event. I looked in the dictionary at the etymology of the word solidarity. It comes from the Latin solidus, which is the link that ties together um, people who are owed money. I think this is a, a contribution during this period that has been difficult and has not yet come to an end. I think we can recognize the commitment of professionals in culture who have helped us to get through the shock and understand and have this desire to get organized and to move forward, understanding that this is a historic event which will be written in future history manuals of our school children. Juliet has already mentioned a number of issues that we're going to touch on which I'm not going to go into now, just to go to the center of what we're actually talking about today. I just wanted to remind you that we're being recorded. And of course, everything that's being recorded will be available on replay. We can access the recording and also the discussion in three languages, French, English, and Spanish. And I've asked, also asked the speakers to keep their uh, their speaking time uh, to what's been agreed so that everyone has a fair amount um, just to not not go beyond the seven minutes that we've all been allocated we really want to have a debate together because some of our participants who are with us now have got things to say in terms of their collection work I think it's important to um, r r just restate that this initiative often falls with the departmental archives in France. So it's, it would be interesting for our foreign um, counterparts to tell us where the initiative comes from in their country. We have six speakers. We have Emily Girard, Futaini Aravani, Mariella Olilila, Elizabeth Ionadis, Jacob Torek Jensen, and Corinne Tepo Cabasse. I'm going to pass over straight away to M. Emily Girard, who is the Vice President of ICOM France and also is Scientific Director of Collections at the Musem in Marseille. She's going to talk to us about the collection that was launched in April last year, about two weeks after the recognition that this was a world pandemic. And so it, this was decided at the Musem to launch a call for participatory projects called Living in Lockdown in order to bring together uh, testimonials and, and artifacts from this very specific time period. She's going to talk about how this call for projects was launched and what the results of it are and what is expected as a result uh, subsequently, Emily, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you very much, Estelle. I'm delighted to be here to share our experience with you and the initial analysis we've made of this work. 
as Estelle reminded everyone, on the 20th of April 2020, we started a collection which was called Living Through Lockdown. The idea was to follow on what uh, from what the National Archive Centres in France had, had done very early, even earlier than us actually. We uh, started by launching, uh, issuing a call for proposals uh, to find who would be the uh, first people to suggest uh, objects and artefacts that would be a sort of iconic emblems of the period we were working th through. Our museum, museum uh, has a particular way of collecting items. We have uh, collection surveys. When we want to add additional items to our collection based around a particular societal theme, we generally go out into the field with uh, curators and surveyors in order to bring back physical uh, artifacts, but also to document them with interviews and photos and things like that. So in the context of the first lockdown, we uh, were struggling because we weren't able to uh, do this uh, in our traditional way. So we used this call for participation, call for proposals, not only to get around the difficulty with the method, but also to try to get a feel for what uh, uh, citizens were feeling during this first lockdown period. So on the Museum's uh, website and on our social media outlets like Facebook and uh, Twitter and so on, we uh, issued a fairly simple call to anyone who wanted to, to suggest objects or items that were the most symbolic for them of this particular period of time. I, I insist on the fact that we did this very quickly. Uh, when the idea first emerged, we talked within a team and there were a lot of questions that came up immediately. Uh, my approach was to say, we haven't got all the answers at this stage. If we try to find all the uh, answers before the problem has been defined and encountered, we will struggle. So let's go for it immediately and let's deal with the problems as they come up. So we fixed a deadline of the 31st of May for this initial uh, proposal phase. Once we issued this uh, call for collection, a question I was asked by some jour journalists, we weren't expecting a lot. We didn't know there would be a, a lot of response. I had absolutely no idea of what kind of proposals would be made to us. But very quickly from the first weekend after the launch of this call, we found that uh, people were very responsive. We'd had 80 different proposals uh, after the first weekend, a, a real varied range of items. There was quite a lot of media coverage at the time. Uh, we were a wonderful client for many media outlets because it gave them an opportunity to talk about COVID, but in a slightly more lighthearted and more positive way than a lot of the information that was uh, going out through the news. So we've benefited from this uh, media expectation, if you like. So during the month, we received more than 600 proposals. Another another lot came on after, after our deadline of the 31st of May. So these proposals mainly came from France, but we also received some from Italy, from Spain, from the UK, and and some slightly less expected uh, things uh, uh, from individual places like Egypt, Dubai, Mexico, and even something from China. So France was very highly represented, represented from the whole of the, the France. But uh, there was a very strong socio-economic bias. We only had items from the traditional museum audience, uh, from fairly well-off uh, sections of the popu population. So these items were not fully representative of the, the whole of the population. Some of the categories of items that were offered to us uh, included 
some things that I expected, protective items, uh, the administrative documents uh, that you had to fill in in France to be able to go go out. There were a lot of masks and face covering, home homemade decorated face coverings with some very beautiful artistic designs. There was a there was a beautiful origami mask, for example. Uh, one lady uh, offered us a, a mask that she had uh, she had embroidered, which matched her gloves and outfit that she wore, and it uh, showed uh, the level of inventivity and and design in the population. Some uh, of the documents you had to fill in, some were very simple, printed out and written at the by hand others who'd who'd uh, written 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 them out rather than printed them with a bit of a humoristic tone as well so these were the some of the first things but they weren't dominant in the collection which was perhaps a first surprise there was a number of uh, items which talked about uh, the support for carers caring professions or, or, or frontline workers like uh, supermarket uh, workers or or, uh, or or refuse disposal workers. So there were ban banners of support or letters of support, objects that uh, could be used during the clap for carers time at 8, 8 p.m., uh, things that people use to make noise. A gentleman came and gave us by hand an item that he fully documented in all its details. It was a, it was like a little garden balcony rake that he'd bought from a particular shop, and he'd uh, brought he'd added Indian sleigh bells to it that he'd collected on a previous uh, journey. So uh, beyond the item itself, people had documented what the document was all about and what it meant to them. And so it was really striking to see uh, the way that people uh, shared of themselves. They they gave the object, but they shared their feeling about it. So the document that explained what the, docu the object was all about was very precious to us. And I could uh, see at this time how, as a museum, we were playing this societal role as a, as a museum, giving people the people who are offering the these items the opportunity to share with us uh, they were talking obviously to an institution uh, and it perhaps was an opportunity for them to exorcise certain things within them there were other items which uh, were about p passing the time so calendars uh, people who had uh, objects that represented the, the threshold between the indoors and the outdoors uh, uh, so then there were things, uh, homemade uh, clothes, because lockdown came in a transitional season between winter and summer. So some people had, didn't have enough outfits for summer. So we ended up with about 200 items, roughly, that we collected together in order to study them. Because following on from the collection, we started a, a study uh, in partnership with the University of Aix-Marseille, uh, a postdoctoral sociologist came in to study the ma material, to carry out interviews with the uh, people who donated them, and to try and expand the uh, scope of the study beyond the socio-economic uh, bias that we had identified earlier on. So very briefly, because I'm nearly up, time's nearly up, we're trying to uh, work on a project to present these items uh, both to give feedback to the don donors and also uh, to the general public we're going to present it in the context of a european project called taking care we've invited the uh, photographer antoine nagata uh, to to come and have another look at these items and uh, give another perspective on them uh, corinne tipu will be able to uh, talk to us about the project we've been carrying out with ICOM costumes. Uh, we've also got a, a project with our publishing uh, director. We're thinking of creating a brochure that will uh, be able to be given out free of charge uh, to thank our donors and to communicate on this uh, collection initiative and to, to, to let the public know what we've done. It's a long-term project. We're going to give uh, this a bit more thought before we finally decide which items will become part of the permanent collection. So thank you very much, Emily, 
for this testimony, which shows us the methodology that needs to be used uh, uh, sometimes in a fairly urgent situation as we'd come across. So uh, Colleen Tipo is going to talk uh, a little bit later. She's going to be the last speaker. Uh, she'll talk a bit about, about some of the issues that you started to mention. I'm now going to hand over to Futaini Aravani, who is the curator of the digital collection at the um, Museum of London. So she was responsible for the video games collection uh, in the museum, which is a very interesting initiative. And she's currently focusing her research on collecting social media. We decided to invite her today to be able to tell us about the project uh, Guardians of Sleep, which is trying to make a record of the dreams that Londoners have had during the pandemic. So, Fotini, over to you. Hi, everyone. First of all, I'm so sorry, but I'm physically in the museum today, so I have to wear my mask. But if you can't hear me, please let me know and I will remove it for my seven minutes. Thank you so much for inviting me and for being part of this beautiful panel. And I'm really glad that I'm following from Emily's talk because our collecting projects were seem so similar, at, at least in their concept. So Museum of London, as you know, um, Emily's Museum, we decided very soon after the first lockdown in March that, as you said, Estelle, that probably this is a moment in history that needs to be documented. So we launched a project, a rapid response contemporary collecting project called Collecting COVID. So the idea was to create a collection to tell the story of COVID for future generations. Uh, we didn't have any exhibition or display plans at the moment, but our focus was to create a collection to represent Londoners' experiences um, during the pandemic. We wanted it to be a very inclusive uh, project. So we wanted to represent um, all as many as, um, uh, as many as possible experiences that people were having. And also we found it uh, a very good opportunity to experiment with different objects, stretching a little bit the definition of a museum object, especially in 2021. So what are the objects that we could collect? We, they could be part of the collection that they would be able to tell the story better in the future. So Guardians of Sleep was um, one of the uh, very first projects that we wanted to do. Um, it was when people, um, including me, I'm sure you as well, started reporting um, a change in the way we were sleeping during the pandemic. A lot of people started sleeping um, more, a lot of people st uh, started uh, sleeping less. And of course, this changed also the way we were dreaming. So. On the one hand, uh, we were going through a pandemic, so all this stress, the unknown, um, was probably affecting um, our dream life and more subconsciously. And on the other hand, we started having a more boring, if you want, life with the stay at home uh, directives are, you know, brains didn't have the stimuli that we would have, you know, in a normal time. So probably our brain started um, overcompensating the lack of stimuli in our wake life and started, um, you know, dreaming more vividly. A lot of people started um, remembering their dreams more or they, uh, they started remembering, you know, uh, details or even colors, which is quite rare. Um, so we wanted to capture that because with our collection, we were um, very interested in uh, the everyday object. We were interested in this simple object that people were creating or they helped them cope with during the pandemic. And we wanted to create a more um, emotional um, collection. We wanted to create a collection where people could like, um, connect to it more uh, personally, create their own um, narratives and have their own interpretation. So we all sleep, 
we all dream. So we felt that was a very, you know, open and inclusive object that um, we could explore collecting. Um, traditionally, objects in dreams in museums uh, collections are either represented by depictions, like creative depictions um, of them. So, you know, you could have a painting of, you know, the dream of Mer Virgin Mary. But um, what I wanted, I didn't want this dissociation between the dreamer and the object. I wanted this dream to be captured in the dreamer's own words, to have this um, hands-on experience, this personal um, testimony. And at the museum, we have a very strong collection of oral histories. So we thought that that could link very well. But we're not psychoanalysts, we're not psychotherapists. So we decided um, to go to the people that know best how to do this dream. So we partnered up with um, Western University in Ontario, Canada, uh, the Department of Psychoanalysis, that they have a research hub that they call Museum of Dreams. It's not a real museum with you know, uh, walls, it's not a building, but it's, you know, they're doing very good work around uh, researching dreams and analyzing them. So um, they put together a team of clinicians, psychotherapists, analysts, psychologists. Um, we had an open call and uh, we had over 500 people expressing interest in capturing and documenting um, their dream. Um, the team, uh, we shortlisted 50 people initially. Uh, we ended up um, recording 21 dreams. Um, it was um, a Zoom interview, basically, it was something like that. So some people chose to be video recorded, some people chose to be uh, audio recorded, but it was very important for us to have um, experts to conduct um, the oral history interview around the dreams. Uh, we felt it was a very uh, intimate, a very emotional sharing. So we wanted to create a very safe space and a very, um, in a very ethical way. Um, we have now accessioned um, these uh, 21 dreams. Um, it was partly an experiment for us, partly pushing the boundaries of our collection. So um, we don't have uh, any plans at the moment to display this collection, uh, partly because who knows what's happening with COVID and partly because Museum of London is moving to a new building in uh, three years time. So we will be soon closing down this current site to prepare um, the move of our collections uh, in 2024. Um, but we're very, very happy that we had this opportunity to try different processes and different objects and to connect with our audiences in a more meaningful way. So rather than serving them content, making them part of our collection. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fotini. Um, you also talked to us about the composition of a working group and, um, and partnerships with experts around this new area for museums. And thank you for underlining this new approach of relationships with the audiences and that we're kind of meeting in other ways in museums. We could come back to this in our discussion later on. The, our third speaker is Maria Olila, who I am welcome today, who is the curator at the National Museum of Finland and secretary of the T TACO Network for Collections Management and Contemporary Documenting in Finland. She's going to talk about the collecting of traces of the pandemic in Finland and talk about how the museum has documented the impact of COVID on in Finnish society. Maria, I think if I understand rightly, you're going to illustrate uh, what you're going to say with a PowerPoint. So we could just try now and see if it works, if you want to try it. 
Yes, that seems to work well. Yes, I think that works. Over to you now. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Maria Olila from the National Museum of Finland, and I hope that you can see my presentation now. Yes. Okay, uh, so the National Museum of Finland documents the contemporary phenomena and turning points of society, as well as the government's actions and its interaction with people. And contemporary documenting is a part of our um, collection work on a regular basis. Uh, the documentation is carried out through various methods, such as interviews, uh, photography, observation, and collecting items. And we have various partners, but um, most importantly, uh, the picture collections of the Finnish Heritage Agency. We represent the same organization. When the pandemic started last year, we recognized um, early on that we are witnessing and uh, living a historical time and we started documenting uh, the COVID-19 in mid-March 2020. Uh, our contemporary documenting practice was ready. We just had to adapt to safety regulations and follow the safety instructions, and it took some planning. Um, we discussed about the themes and the viewpoints with other Finnish museums, uh, mostly via the Baco network. And we also discussed with other uh, memory organizations, such as the Finnish Literature Society. And so we started a documenting project that is mostly museum initiated and still ongoing. And together with uh, picture collections, we've documented the crisis from various viewpoints, but we've mostly focused on the society and the sectors that are critical to the functioning of the society. Um, and their employees, you could say the frontline workers, I guess. And these sectors, uh, what are they? Uh, healthcare, the parliamentary work, uh, trade, and so on. I'll show you a few examples of our uh, documenting work. Um, the border of the Usuma region was closed from March 28th to April 15th, 2020, to stop the coronavirus from spreading. And there were restrictions on movement, which meant that the civil liberties were restricted. And it was quite a shock and had an impact uh, on the everyday life of many people. I interviewed two members of the Finnish parliament and the constitutional law committee on this matter. And uh, they stated that even though limiting people's movement is a restriction on civil rights, in this, this uh, situation, other civil rights can be restricted to secure people's right to live. Uh, there was quite a lot of debate about this in Finland. We documented the border control work of the police by photographing, observing, and also interviewing Jussi Päivänsalo, the superintendent who was in charge. Uh, on the right, you can see us doing the interview at a safe distance by the closed border. Another critical sector we documented was the healthcare for COVID-19 patients. Uh, we visited temporary COVID-19 ward at the surgical hospital in Helsinki and interviewed two uh, nurses, both of them working with uh, COVID-19 patients. Uh, on the left, you can see intensive nurse Marko Kivioja and on the right, uh, nurse Rosa Aaltonen. We also collected items, their working clothes and their protective equipment. In the middle, you can see my colleague, creator Anna-Mari Immonen and Marko Kivioja just before the interview. As you can see, they are wearing no masks because nobody was at that time in Finland. If you look at the photos below, uh, these types of protective, protective equipment was used uh, in the surgical hospital uh, in June 2020. Protective gloves, face shield, protective coat, surgical mask and so on. A few weeks ago, we also got a coronavirus test set to our collection. Um, remote work is something that many of us can relate to, and these earphones are such a common item. But in our collection, they represent a wider phenomenon, uh, how the pandemic increased the remote work in specialist positions, even in the Finnish parliament. Uh, Finnish MP, 
Bella Forskran used these earphones into parliamentary work in uh, spring 2020. She also gave us an interview last fall about the parliamentary work in the time of crisis. Um, and finally, a few words about our latest project. It's the municipal election in 2021, the first election during the pandemic time in Finland. Um, the election was postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic from April to June. Uh, advanced voting lasted two weeks and they created these new ways to vote safely, the drive-in voting and voting outdoors. And these photos are from uh, the drive-in polling station near Malmi Airport in Helsinki. They were taken in uh, 3rd of June. The actual e election uh, day was last Sunday. So we've documented uh, the election by interviewing, photographing and collecting items and the project is still ongoing. I'll interview the director of the electoral administration at the Ministry of Justice tomorrow. Uh, so far, we've acquired tens of items and interviews and hundreds or even thousands of photos relating to COVID-19 into our collections. Uh, we don't know the full impact of the pandemic yet, so we'll continue exploring and documenting the effect COVID-19 will have on our society. Um, thank you. I can stop sharing now. Thank you very much, Maria. Did you want to add anything else after your PowerPoint uh, to, to add to our debate, or was that all? Uh, that was all. <laughs> thank you. Merci beaucoup et merci à thank you very much, Maria. Thank you uh, very much to all of our speakers who are keeping to our time very closely. So that's very good. Thank you very much. Our uh, fourth uh, uh, speaker is Elizabeth. Ionidas, who is curator at the uh, National uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in Athens, and she's also an art therapist. Hi, Elizabeth. You're going to tell us about your work and uh, particularly the education program for primary schools. Uh, since 2017, uh, you've been working with Mrs. Pantagutsu, I'm not sure if she's with us today, uh, a, a program to collect artistic psychotherapy items, which is entitled Exploring Museum Pictures, Exploring My Image. It's a artistic psychotherapy program for the general public. And I think uh, today you're planning to tell us about two projects uh, related to COVID. Firstly, a project focusing on uh, guiding people in uh, dealing with change during the post-lockdown period and a second program which was created specifically for healthcare professionals in order to help them to cope with the intensity of their work and their fatigue through art. So I'll let, let you tell us about these two innovative approaches. Thank you very much Elizabeth, over to you. Hello, good afternoon, and thank you very much for the invitation to be here with you today. Thank you to my fellow panelists. It's very interesting what I've been hearing today. And thank you, of course, to all of you for being uh, here. Will it be possible for me to share my screen as well? Please. Okay. Let me know if you can. Can you see it? Okay. So overnight, uh, COVID-19 disrupted what until now has been uh, thought of as familiar, self-evident and taken for granted. The restrictive measures of protection brought about an interruption to the flow of life, affecting each person individually. Everyone reacts differently in an effort to process, comprehend and deal with the stimuli emerging from this encounter with something so unfamiliar and so unexpected. Within uh, this uh, feeling of being in limbo, uh, experienced worldwide, despite its rationalization, something remains that cannot be fully absorbed by the symbolic nor by social reality. There is something which cannot be verbalized nor be fully explained, either individually or collectively. What is it that breaks within each person's equilibrium 
when things as we know them are disrupted? What is his or her position with regards to limits and extremities as they emerged through social distancing brought on by COVID-19? Such questions can be the starting point for exciting journeys of self-discovery. The act of creation can prove to be a personal pathway of discovery as to how each person responds to change. During the first lockdown, which in Greece was from March until May 2020, and not knowing what was lying ahead, we wanted through our platform, having our already established art psychotherapy program at the National Museum of Contemporary Art in Athens, uh, and as a means of solidarity, we wanted to provide people with a creative idea that could be an act of connection and commitment to one's being in the world. Thus, we suggested creative journaling, which is as a creative practice could help with an individual search to track an internal relationship with one's being and connection with a drastically changing world in the times of COVID-19. So how to cope with change, we gave six tips to help individuals deal with any stress that they might have been feeling during these times. So start doing things that give you pleasure, return to your old routine, talk to your loved ones, be mindful of the news that you read, visit a museum, and adapting may take time. My colleague, Irini Kokoru, who's also an art psychotherapist, wrote an article, which is an exercise as well, titled Creative Journals, Visual Narrative as the Art of Opening Up Following Confinement in the Times of COVID-19. As a record, the creative journal encompasses at the same time the experience of capturing what is happening, but also keeping a distance from the experience. Within the unclear external field that is changing due to the coronavirus, the sense of who am I is stabilized and remains a point of reference. A deep sense of liveliness and continuity is thus conferred as it helps one to remain present in the here and now. Through the creative act, it's possible to track the sense of who I am. You can find more information on this on our website and actually I invite you if you want to visit and actually do this exercise. Later on, and as time was passing, we wanted to do something for healthcare professionals. It was something we had in our mind for a very long time, but we wanted to do something very meaningful for them. So as we know, art reveals, entertains, excites, activates our creativity, turns us into dreamers, fighters, or travelers. In the difficult period we're all going through due to the, the pandemic, art can uplift us, liberate us, and above all, unite us. The learning department of the National Museum of Contemporary Art wanted to honor health professionals for the valuable work and the tireless support that they offer to the community, created the program EMS for Health, aiming to assist in reducing through art the intensity and fatigue and open a window of dream to dream and creative expression. The health professionals who wished to participate expressed their interest by sending us an email and then they received in their email a work of art from the Amst collection in the form of an electronic card. We sent 25 artworks from the collection in total, some of which you can see here. On their own time, they conversed with the work. They were inspired, they thought, they felt, and they dreamt. And then they sent us the response in whatever form they wished. They wrote their thoughts and feelings in a text, a story, a poem, or even a phrase. They created their own paintings, constructions, photographs, videos, or whatever else they wanted. By sending the response, each participant stated whether they wished to receive another card, thus continuing the creative conversation with contemporary art. The program lasted from 7th, the 7th of December 2020 until the 28th of February 2021. At the end of the program, an online presentation was created on the EMST website and people presented their, with under their name or anonymously the creations. I just want to show you a very short video. I don't know if it's going to play.
Among the responses we received from the participants are the following. Dear EMS team, I hope you're well. Unfortunately, I did not have time to reply to the last work you sent me. In January, I was posted elsewhere and was working with COVID-19 patients, but now I'm back to my original post. Thank you once again for the opportunity you gave me. It really helped me a lot. I managed to close the year in the most creative way. I'll be glad to participate in more of the museum's activities. Have a nice week. Sincerely, Panagiotis. Hi there. I'd like to take part in this. Please, can you send me some art that I can respond to? And thank you for setting this up. As a health professional, I don't think I'm alone in being very tired. I miss my colleagues. I miss the support they give me in a job that I love, but which challenges me every day to be the best I can be. The children and families and carers I work with are amazing. And this gift that you're offering me will be something that I can endeavor to use to nourish my work with them. Best wishes, Christina, a specialist in mental health clinician. We're very proud of this program that was created with love and respect for the tireless work of our frontline health workers. And this was recognized when in April, the program was shortlisted for the Art Against COVID Awards. The president and jury of the Arts and Health International Foundation considered that our candidacy demonstrates the outstanding efforts made by our organization in response to the health effects caused by COVID-19. So I invite you to visit the website and look at all the artwork created. Now, before I close, I just wanna say this. Um, we must keep in mind that although the prevailing uh, feeling right now is fear, loneliness and isolation, Everyone is experiencing different forms of trauma, as we've seen from the rise in domestic violence and child abuse cases. So the way trauma is experienced is different, but art appeals to everyone. Museums through their programs can provide a platform for any kind of expression and can create a safe environment for that expression. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, for this testimony. And we will definitely go and have a look with a lot of interest on, at the works on the website. After you, there is Jacob Torek Jensen, who will be speaking. He is the curator uh, at the National Museum of Science and Technology in Denmark. And it seems really important for us to have a scientific museum here. And he's also a board member of SIMUZET, the International Committee for Museums and Collections of Science and Technology. His, what he's going to sh share with us will be focused on the way in which his museum tested through the first lockdown in March 2020, a new type of exhibition. I'm not sure if I've got the translation right here exhibition of immediate relevance and he's going to show how this museum has also done collection and documentation work and how it got focused on in ingenuity and that's in the innovation of which has pre been presented during the health crisis and this collection has been the focus of an exhibition focused on Corona crisis or creativity, which tries to look at the positive side in terms of inventivity. So Jacob will hand over to you now. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much for the invitation. Uh, thank you to all of you for participating and thank you for some very interesting presentations so far. I hope you can uh, see my screen now. So what I will be talking about is how we, we use this corona crisis, the pandemic, to, uh, to experiment with how we are working as a museum, how we are doing collection, uh, and how we are developing our uh, practice. Um, the museum, uh, we're the National Museum of Science and Technology uh, of Denmark and are located just north of Copenhagen in an old industrial facility. We have quite a unique collection. For instance, uh, the first car in Denmark, which can still drive. So it's actually the world's oldest functioning car. 
uh, and a lot of other cool stuff. But as you see, we are kind of in a, not the best kind of environment for the museum. So we're working on um, developing a new museum in Copenhagen in this old power plant. And uh, as part of this process, we are experimenting a lot today at our present site of how we can develop a new type of museum for the future. And this project is part of that, what I will be sharing today. So during the first uh, lockdown in, uh, in the spring of 2020, we saw in society that there was a lot going on, even though we were all told to stay at home. There was a lot of ingenuity, innovation, transformation taking place to adapt to this new reality. What we do as a museum is to do document that change. Um, we are collecting objects for the museum. Uh, so we have this for the future. But we, what we wanted to do this time is actually take this documentation of the, what we saw in society and turn it into an exhibition format uh, and into something that our audience could enjoy when they could return to the museum. And we experimented with this new format that we call rapid relevance exhibitions, where we together in partnerships with our surrounding communities, companies, NGOs and institutions are documenting what is going on and turning it into an exhibition. And that's what I will show you today. I'll just show you a bit some highlights from, from, uh, from the exhibition, Corona, Crisis and Creativity. So during the first lockdown, there was a, a major lack of face shield for frontline uh, workers working in hospital, elder care homes, in public transportation. Uh, and we saw a lot of uh, different in initiatives to produce these uh, face shields, where, which was so much in demand. For instance, a lot of people who have been playing around with three small 3D printers in their basement started to produce these face shields and got together in a group, uh, DK Makers Against Corona, producing face shields for the frontline workers. We also saw big Danish companies shifting production. Uh, this is a Danish company called Konfas, which usually produces water pumps, who started producing face shields for the, for the frontline workers. Uh, also, Lego, you might know the Lego brick, they started producing face shields. Another big thing which was happening in the spring of 2020 was that we all needed hand sanitizer, which was difficult to get uh, to buy in shops. So a lot of breweries and distilleries changed production here. Uh, some of you might know that we do like a good beer here in Denmark, but instead of producing beer, they started to producing hand sanitizers. And we, have, we collected these hand sanitizers and, uh, for our collection and for this exhibition. Another uh, interesting initiative was this, there was a major fear in society that there would not be enough ventilators at the hospitals. This is an uh, example of a Danish company and a Danish university who got together to develop this emergency ventilator, which could be easily produced from accessible parts, easily accessible parts at a low cost. So if, if we got in a situation where we didn't have enough ventilators, um, these could easily and quickly be produced and help at the hospitals. But we didn't just want to show what was going on right now. We as a museum who has an amazing collection wanted to give perspective to the crisis that took place right now. In our collection, we have quite an uh, interesting, um, a lot of objects from the Second World War of these substitute products that were developed because in this crisis, there was a lack of material and a lot of lack of products. So you needed to be innovative to come up with new ideas um, for things that you couldn't buy because of the German occupation of Denmark. This is an example of a small tube that people would use to smoke the very last bit of the cigarettes, which was so difficult to get. So you would take this needle, put it into the cigarette, and then you could smoke uh, the entire cigarette. And this is an example of bicycle tires. Uh, it was difficult to get rubber. So here you see examples of tires made out of rope, for instance, or metal. Uh, we still needed our bicycles to get around. So we put the current crisis into um, perspective of another big crisis, which was the German occupation of Denmark during the Second World War. We were able to open the exhibition 
when the museum reopened in May 2020. So it was very fast from idea, collecting these objects together with the institution into the society, going into our collection, give a new perspective of the objects we have in our collection, get it all together into an exhibition and open it when the museum opened in the end of May. So when our visitors uh, were coming back to our museum, they could see the crisis unfolding in society, the pandemic already something that we were dealing with in the museum uh, in, in the context of an exhibition. So what can the museum do? So we can provide perspective to our current issues, put what is going on into a bigger picture, see how this is different from other crises or are there any similarities? But if we need to deal with these current events and use them in our activities right away, we need to rethink how we work in our institutions, prioritize our internal resources so we can actually focus on these current events and, and document them, collect them and turn them into an, an exhibition uh, right away for, the, uh, for our audiences. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Jacob, et bravo, effectivement, pour uh, la réaction. Thank you very much. Uh, Jacob, and, and congratulations on how quickly you were able to work. To finish this uh, final uh, this uh, panel discussion, we're going to hand over to Corinne Tepo Capassi, who is uh, works at uh, the Chateau of Versailles, but she's speaking in her capacity as the uh, chair of the International Committee of ICOM for. Uh, costumes, uh, fashion and textile, as that was what uh, Emily Chira was referring to earlier. In this context, she is collecting uh, COVID masks uh, as part of an initiative that's been funded by ICOM as part of the Solidarity Programme that has organised this Zoom meeting. The, the project is called uh, Clothing the Pandemic, and that's the project that Corinne is going to present to us today. Thank you. Over to you, Corinne. Thank you very much and thank you to all of you. Thank you to Estelle, thank you to Juliette for the invitation. I'm really very glad. I, I really wanted to be part of this session because as you mentioned, uh, these are really hot topics that we're talking about here. Collections is the heart of museums and collecting during a crisis is really uh, something that we can't say we're full of joy to, to be participating, but it's really exciting to be part of it. I'm going to ask you if I can share my screen because I prepared a few images because I thought that would help us a little bit. I don't know if I can do it now, can I? Estelle, yes, yes, we can. We can, we can try this now. Um, sharing screen. Can I share the screen? Can you see my screen there? Yes, we can see. So as Estelle uh, said, the ICOM costume um, committee uh, took part in the CEREC event uh, on the Solidarity Project, which uh, got a number of different committees working together. It, it seemed to me in spring 2020 that Costume needed to do something about masks because this was the, 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 the object that the whole crisis seemed to be focused on at the beginning in terms of we saw different speakers who've mentioned this, the, the problem with availability of masks, of manufacturing of masks, etc. So first of all, we needed to protect ourselves with a piece of fabric or paper or plastic. And it seemed that ICOM costume, I felt ICOM costume had something to do there. So I, I talked to my colleagues who handle clothing um, collections. Costume is, is about clothing, historical clothing, show clothes. Uh, it's also fashion and design and industrial production of clothes. 
So given all these different parameters, I tried to reach out to our network to find out who was interested in this and who was collecting. I was really surprised to discover that there was only one project at the time, and it was in London at Westminster University, um, which was focused on, as we've just seen in a really interesting way, uh, with Jacob, which was focused on the change of pro industrial production lines. So they focused on the manufacturing of um, British clothes, uh, and their focus on producing masks, and then there was also the Rome Initiative, and one in in sorry in Toronto, of we had three create cu curators working together on fashion and textiles to bring together very specific collections. So there weren't a lot of us at the beginning. We knew that the museum was collecting. And we asked Musem whether there was a collection of masks, but actually it wasn't just masks for them, but of course they had a lot of masks that were proposed. And then uh, obviously we ended up uh, creating more relationships with colleagues. And I really went kind of door knocking. Um, that was in spring 2020 through the summer up to the CEREC uh, call for projects in the autumn. I really felt that there was a project to, to propose and we managed to, to win this funding, which we started uh, together with the ICME, the International Committee um, in Canada, because the largest collection of masks up to now is is the link in Canada, um, where they have over 200 masks, and there will soon be a um, we're going to have more uh, um, artifacts proposed or people that will want to be involved in the collections on all sectors. What seemed really interesting to me in these different projects was that the collections in these different museums in these different countries were very different from each other. There were calls for proposals uh, like MUSEM, uh, which were a sort of broad calls, but there were also specific focuses, uh, for example, the Westminster University or a, university, a museum in New Zealand with colleagues who were focused on indigenous peoples and wanted to see how they were responding to the pandemic. This was also the case at the Royal Ontario Museum. Um, because they were also collecting artifacts linked to the Am Amerindian people, which showed some very interesting initiatives, including um, the, the pandemic project. There were other national collections, uh, like in Hungary, in the Czech Republic, in different museums. And one of the goals of this project of clothing the pandemic project was to uh, draw out a subject that everyone would be able to e even if it wasn't even if they weren't able to respond during the creation of the project they could respond during 2021 and that's what's happening now so the project is focused on three key aspects you've got the web address in front of you here there's a clothing the pandemic workshop which is starting uh, next week i've put in the chat the address for signing up for this workshop we will have two parts to this workshop first of all it was going to be just one block in the spring but, but it was so interesting and so rich that it's been divided into two there's going to be a first part in the spring and a second part in the autumn this project is in partnership with other ICOM entities that are partners of the project. And um, this gives us real added value and real quality because everyone has their own expertise. 
So I'd invite you to look at the program. The sessions are focused on two days, um, focused on collections in museums, but especially sharing knowledge, sharing experience, because some projects have are different and how we can learn from each other. So the idea is obviously this is going to be participatory workshop, which is going to go very quickly here. You can see uh, the program. If you go to the website, there's going to be the participation of the MUSEM on Thursday and also ICOM Canada. Um, the first part will be moderated by ICME the ethnography museums and the second part by icom canada with with online sales of artists masks to raise funds uh, to support museums so this is really uh, actions of solidarity here so what's really interesting is to see that the way in which the manufacturing of masks, the collection of masks, the exhibition of masks have created solidarity between museums in order to help them stay open. And then finally, the, uh, a second part that will take part in the autumn, which is focused on conservation and preservation of these objects that have been collected. There's documentation and archiving, and then the conservation and preservation as the second part. So this is the first activity of the project. The second uh, activity is an online exhibition. The, the principle of the SAREC uh, solidarity call for projects was that it needed to take place during 2021 and needs to be fully online and as accessible as possible. And and as much as possible in ICOM's three languages and other languages if necessary. So the online exhibition will open in November. We are obviously working hard on this and it brings together uh, the first group from existing collections. We're not talking about temporary collections here, but collections of masks that are going to stay in museums. We will have about 100, perhaps even more, masks represented, uh, covering all subjects, all collection aspects, whether it's political, sociological, protests masks, uh, social movement masks that we've seen in 2020 following the pandemic, um, uh, homemade masks, masks of different communities, of, of different stylists and we'll bring these all together and compare them with the goal with a stylistic and critical goal and then the the last action of this project is a conference event that was going to take place in december online which will bring together lingu linguistics experts historians uh, curators of museums and also people from from the industry and medical sectors. So I think I've more or less finished. I'll stop the sharing there. I hope I've managed that. So uh, this project has a, a final development, which I hope is going to continue beyond the presentation, the workshop and the exhibition. It's a project of uh, surveying these collections around the world, like ICOM likes to do this, to, to, to map all the different points where collections have been organized and where they are remaining within museums or where they've been inventoried and where they're accessible online and then places that have seen exhibitions uh, maybe temporary uh, exhibitions uh, during these almost two years of crisis so please do come and join us uh, see the project can uh, 
check out the platforms and the websites of our partners, ICMI and ICOM Canada. Thank you very much. Thank you, Corinne, for this uh, very clear presentation, which shows us how much we've opened up to other fields of expertise. So we have about 20 minutes left until the end of this debate. I've looked from time to time to see if there are questions on the chat. I haven't actually found any questions on the chat. Is there someone that would like to ask a question to one of our speakers or perhaps share an additional perspective or story of your own? I know that the museum, the post office museum in France also carried out some collection work. I don't know if the one of the representatives is with us and would like to say something now. I think this is Agnes Mirande who's with us now. Do you, could you say something about your collection project? Yes, I can say something very quickly. This collection was launched at the beginning of the first lockdown together with the archives of the of the post office group because the the post office museum is a company museum which is intended to maintain the history and present the history of the french post office so we carried out a collection a mixed collection of uh, stories that could feed into the museum's collections, but also archives that could go into the archives held and managed by the post office archivists. So in the first lockdown, we contacted representatives of all the different subsidiaries and departments of the groups and also photographers and communication officers. And we quickly uh, got together a sense of uh, a collection dynamic. And we started to collect objects from last summer and we're still collecting now. And we have now about 4,000 photographs and 120 videos plus more rare objects such as masks made specifically by some divisions of the group when work uh, picked up um, on site, but especially with the post office bank, which produced their own mask and a welcome kit for their staff coming back last summer to work on site. And we also have samples of prototypes of visors and door handles manufactured using 3D printers which are used within the, usually these machines are used uh, within the company uh, for other purposes. So this is just an overview of what we've been able to do during this period. Thank you very much, Agnes. This gives us a story from a company private museum because um, companies have also been uh, upset by this crisis. And I think you've carried out this work together with the post office archivists in coordination. I can see that in the chat there is a question that Emmanuel McCain would like to ask Emily Girard. Emmanuel, please share. Good afternoon. Thank you for this discussion. This is also the opportunity to, for me to remind you that the National Education Museum in Rouen has, all, Rouen has also launched a collection which is ongoing, um, led by Georgia Sant'Angelo. And I wanted to ask Emily, how have audiences that have sent objects are they asking to have them back after a certain time or how is that working or are they giving everything to museums and how are you going to handle them afterwards 
Hi, Emmanuel. No, we didn't have any conditions. I've got just one person who made a pro proposal of a structure they made by adding a, a can that they they added a, 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 a stone every day and they gave it to us but then they said actually i'm i'm too emotionally attached to this actually i'd, I'd like to have it back at home but this is the only example um because every other time people have uh, suggested uh, artifacts it was going to go into our collections and apart from the specific case out of the 613 proposals there's been no other example i didn't specify that we supported um, the sending of a, of a gift form which uh, gave us um, permission to reuse photographs that were that were sent to us for communication and promotion of this campaign uh, and we didn't have to list we didn't list all the possible uses so when we have specific uses we now have to go back to donors to ask for press use for reuse uh, within our exhibition so we keep communicating with them but we have created connections so that people respond very quickly because every time uh, we've sent off and asked for information people have responded very quickly so there's a kind of interpersonal link between the museum and private individuals um emmanuel in order to encourage promotion of as you were sharing thank you thank you very much thank you emmanuel uh, because you're with us would you be happy to uh, tell us about your experience of collecting uh, within the field of education because your uh, museum focuses on schools and education. Yes, uh, a colleague uh, of mine, just like many people here, uh, started very quickly and uh, worked in collaboration with others. Uh, I'm not the best person to talk about this, really. We we worked with the Museum where Emily Girard works. We've been worked with other national museums and the Ministry of Culture's archives uh, in order to kind of work together and distribute the collecting work. The Museum has also sent us a number of uh, items or, or proposals which uh, were relevant to our field of collection, uh, the field of education. In a very broad sense, we focus on uh, education and upbringing even within a family home. So we are continuing to have uh, items and proposals that are that are sent to us by families that uh, have talked about the way they've lived through the the period, the homeschooling and uh, education within the family home in the broadest sense. So we've probably got a, a hundred or so different proposals. A lot of things related to, to schooling and education, uh, particularly digital, digital tools. Uh, that was something we expected in a sense because it was a, a key aspect of this whole period of homeschooling, uh, the use of uh, uh, of digital devices and screens for uh, the, the homeschooling. But we haven't just had digital uh, devices. We've uh, had spelling tests that grandparents dictated over uh, the the internet to their grandchildren. We had a, a bottle of olive oil because a, a, a pupil uh, were supposed to go on a school trip to Spain, but because they couldn't go, they did a Spanish week at home, which was a lot of fun. There were drawings and things like this, but we've got a lot of digital uh, devices and 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 aspects of homework that's been done by kids on digital devices. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. That was very interesting. There was another uh, question in the chat from Asia which was a question for Jacob, a question about the exhibition that you mentioned about uh, the connections with the German occupation of Denmark. Our colleague was asking why uh, did, if I, I'm looking at the question properly, 
sorry, he's saying, um, why did you have a, a temporary exhibition, a, a temporary exhibit on the German occupation, but unfortunately it wasn't organized? That's what the question said. Yeah. So, Jakob, can you answer that one? Yeah, thank you for the question. I'm sorry if there was any confusion. I had to go through it quickly to get through all my points. Um, no, we didn't, we were not planning a temporary exhibition about the German occupation. But what we did when we were thinking about taking these objects that we had collected in uh, relation to the COVID pandemic, we wanted to put these objects in uh, perspective with other objects from our collection. And then we went into the collection of these objects we have from the German occupation of Denmark during the Second World War, also to show the value of our collection and also to show why it is important that we are collecting objects now during the, um, the corona pandemic. So we put the, um, the crisis of the corona pandemic and these objects in uh, perspective with the objects from the from the German occupation of Denmark during the Second World War, so gave a new perspective of some of the objects that we already had uh, in our collection. Uh, bonjour, merci. Uh, many thanks. Actually, I didn't understand merci that. Merci beaucoup pour ces éclaircissements. I thought that it was an. Uh, nous avons aussi une autre question. Thank you very much, Jacob, for your explanations. We've also got a question from. Eric Dokweda, who asks, how can we uh, promote the roles of museums uh, currently during the pandemic? What are the uh, policies that can be used in order to enhance the reputation of museums? I think uh, it's a question for Jacob, but others could perhaps also respond. So Jacob, would you like to perhaps start? Uh... Can, can you please repeat the question? I didn't get all of it in the translation, sorry. Yes, the question from our colleague is to think about how can we promote the, the value of our museums uh, currently? Museums have been very highly impacted by COVID. What policies should we put in place in order to uh, enhance the reputation of museums and promote their role? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> um, that's a very good question. Actually, I would say, I don't know how it is in your countries, but most things here in Denmark are, are open now. Museums are open. Um, it's a, everyone can come, but we are not seeing, like people are coming back, but we are still not up to the visitor numbers we had before the pandemic. There could be a lot of reasons for this. But I think museums, at least in Denmark, and, and also what I hear in other countries, we have a job to actually uh, rethink our role in, in our society. I think like what all the speakers today have been talking about, how museums are not just dealing with the past, but are dealing with the present and what is going on now to secure the future. is a very important uh, aspect of our work and something we should emphasize that we are not just about like old stuff. It's super important with our collections uh, because they are a memory of our past, but that we are also very much um, interested in what is going on now to, to secure that we have these things for the future. But I, I do think we have a, at least in Denmark, there is an issue that we need to, to, um, to rethink our role uh, and our the value in society. Um, to be relevant for, for people after the pandemic. Can I contribute to that? Um, Jakob, I agree with you 100%. Uh, I just want to add that um, change is constant and it's inevitable, and especially in the times we're living. So I think it's important to, to keep in mind that we are open, uh, we are inviting, we should be inviting. I mean, I, I really believe that cultural spaces should have been open all this time, but they are safe environments. I mean, that's the, what we need to promote. We are safe places. People can actually feel safe when they visit a museum, when they visit a cultural space. We need to respect that. Uh, we also need to make considerations regarding the programs we deliver. So blended learning could be um, 
part of that, but I think it's very important to promote the safety that people can feel secure. Would any of our other speakers like to answer our colleague from Chad? I'd, I'd like to ask a, an additional question. Do you think with this crisis that the educational role of our museums has increased or been enhanced? Uh, is that something that's happened? Corinne, would you like to answer that question? Pardon, pas répondre à cette question. I didn't want to answer that question, actually. I, I wanted to, to ask a, a, another question. Uh, Juliet talked about ICOM define this uh, project to, to redefine museums. So we've talked about collecting objects, that's an important aspect, but I think there were some keywords, some key terms that talked about um, in, intangible heritage in, in museums. And I think. Uh, particularly from our non-French speaking uh, speakers today. We've heard quite a lot about this aspect, the intangible heritage. Uh, uh, in the project uh, Clothing a Pandemic, we've had an artist who worked on the idea of breath, uh, based on the idea that, that, that breath is, is life for human people, but uh, breath uh, was also very dangerous uh, during the pandemic time. So there were other masks designed by artists, which were a form of artistic interpretation of this uh, fact that people were very afraid of other people's breath. Um, we had some Amerindian artists who've explored this aspect very extensively. So in the very rich presentations that we've heard today, there was a lot of focus on collecting intangible things like dreams, uh, the interpretation of dreams, for example, and how we can trace the presence of COVID in, in dreams. We've heard about psychotherapy and art therapy. Uh, so there are these uh, sociological and societal reflections. These have fed into our clothing, uh, the pandemic exhibition. We wanted to look at at what questions a museum should be asking during a crisis and should the museum be able to uh, make give some examples not necessarily models or role models but but something that could be useful in another time of crisis maybe not a pandemic an earthquake or or any form of mass destruction event man, um, any kind of natural disaster. How could the museum respond to that situation? So the subtitle of Clothing a Pandemic was uh, Finding Solidarity and Resilience in Museums. I found this afternoon's discussion very uh, interesting because there's a whole varied range of proposals. So I just wanted to come back to this, this term, intangible heritage, which has been thrown into question in this new uh, definition of museums. And I think we've had a number of good illustrations today of the way uh, in which colleagues around the table here have great resources to offer in terms of intangible heritage, uh, digital heritage, uh, all of these things. Thank you very much. That's a great summary, Corinne. Thank you very much. A lot of issues have emerged and we can see how inventive and creative our museums have been over this period. Before I hand back to our chair to uh, conclude the meeting, are there any final questions? It's not too late. If there aren't any further questions, I just want to take the opportunity to thank all of our speakers for the quality of everything they've said. I'm going to say goodbye and see you soon. And I'm going to hand over to Juliet to conclude our meeting. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Estelle, for allowing me to 
give some concluding words. Those concluding words are should be really be your words. Uh, what Corinne has said has was very appropriate just now. What what you said reminds us that the definition of, of, of museums has been very important to us during this period. It's brought us back to some of the fundamental issues about what museums are, uh, what is the heart of what we do. Uh, it's been as important as ever to think about that. And what you said is that the frontier between the tangible and the intangible, the material and the immaterial has perhaps faded somewhat during this period. And I think that's something that we will see increasingly in the the traces and the, the the vestiges that we have collected of this COVID time. Thank you to all of you, all of you speakers. It was a wonderful discussion and debate. It's been great to be together. Thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you to all of the audience and all of you who have been listening to us from the four corners of the world. I think out of the 80 odd uh, listeners, there were uh, people uh, from from all around the world. I can see people sending us different messages in the chat to tell us where they're from. For us, that is something we've been particularly delighted about. It's been one of the uh, interesting and important effects of the COVID period. We've been able to connect together uh, with, with, with people. We, didn't have to travel to, to, to meet together. It's been very surprising in some ways, but we found that each time we've held a meeting like this, where we've mainly been focusing on try creating a connection and relationship between us, they've often been quite spontaneous meetings, but every time we've done it, they've been 90, 100, sometimes up to, up to 200 people. But every time there've been people from all around the world, not always the same people either. Uh, so I think that's uh, something uh, that's been uh, very important and we should perhaps keep a hold of that as some of the traces of uh, of COVID. I don't know how it can be stored in a museum, but it's certainly a part of the ICOM heritage from uh, COVID. So we're finished for today, but we'll be together again very soon. The next session is not going to be in a month's time. Uh, because uh, in a month's time, it will be the middle of July. We thought it wasn't the best time to do it. So we've brought it forward to the 6th of July, a Tuesday still, from uh, one, uh, 1 till 2.30 as ever. And we're going to talk about a question that was being touched on today, which is very important. We're going to ask whether COVID has distanced uh, the audience from museums or brought them closer to museums. When we started to look at this question with some of our intended speakers, we realized it was a real issue, a genuine issue for discussion. Have uh, our, our audiences coming back? Will it be the same audience? Are the audience going to visit museums on the internet? Uh, and a real question have we actually touched the uh, audiences that that weren't coming to museums and might be drawn into museums uh, in the future i hope that you'll be able to join us very many of you we'll have some very interesting and talented speakers from a range of countries uh, that's very important to us that we hear testimonials from all over the world i'm going to finish there and wish you a very good afternoon and for all of you who will be part of uh, ICOM France's uh, annual meeting on Friday, we'll probably see you uh, very soon on Friday. See you soon and thank you again for being part of this today.